Right, thanks for that introduction. In fact, uh, the previous speaker said a lot of things that I think I was going to say. So it would have been better if I spoke first, because he has said most of the things I was going to say. Yeah, this was a good presentation, by the way. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Simatina's water and energy optimization uh, as they pertain to chemical plants. Uh, yeah. Okay, so perhaps before I start, let me just introduce to you our at uh, Vance University. As it has been mentioned in the introduction, I, I, I hold a chair there. And the work that we do really is divided into two. We've got work in the uh, batch processes and, and also continuous operations. In batch operations, we look at heat integration, waste water minimization, as well as the design synthesis uh, and optimization of these operations. By the way, South Africa has a lot of batch operations. We've got agrochemical facilities. We've got uh, food industry, for example, and the pharmaceuticals. These are our batch uh, operations in South Africa. So there's a lot of work that we're doing in that area. And then on the continuous side, it's mainly looking at utility systems, uh, de bottlenecking, where we look at energy and water in particular. And um, you'd see, for example, uh, we are doing some work uh, in clean coal technology, uh, looking at integrated gasification combined cycle. This work I'm doing with the CSIR, by the way, regardless of the fact that it was mentioned I'm the chairperson of the board, but I do a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, with this answer, and, uh, and forget about that today. Mm -hmm. So you can ask as many questions as you can. So we'll do a lot of work with the CSIR in this area. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing now with the students is looking at the comprehensive utility system optimization where we look at the cooling water system design as well as the hot utility system design. Really, if you talk about the hot utility, hot utility system design, it's, it's nothing complicated. It is a boiler with this associated set of heat exchangers. So a boiler produces steam that fits energy into the plant and the heat exchangers to really exchange that heat. And then a cooling water system design is just the opposite of that. You've got a cooling tower which takes away heat from the plant and then with that you also have your set of uh, heat exchangers. What I'm going to talk about really this morning is uh, that it is on water and energy uh, optimization. So the presentation is going to be as follows. I just have a background and motivation perhaps for what I'm going to uh, talk about a uh, problem statement because it's very important that we understand what uh, the parameters are what we're trying to achieve uh, the development of the model and the uh, I must confess at this stage perhaps declare at this stage that the slight deviation major deviation between my presentation and the previous one is that here you might see a bit of equations mathematical equations I haven't found a better way of communicating uh, other than using equations but I'll try to explain what these are and then model uh, development, illustrative example, a uh, case study. Uh, we've done a lot of work as well, uh, 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 nationally and internationally, applying these techniques. And then um, results and discussion, then I'll conclude. So where does this come from? I, I think this has been covered very, very beautifully by the previous speaker, but really, it's trying to uh, look at the water and energy nexus. Uh, Dr. Mola in his presentation said that, for example, Cape Town has a shortage of water. In Eastern South Africa as a whole, it doesn't have water. Uh, we are the deadliest driest country in the world. So the water that we see is really not the water that there is. We don't have water. But the interesting thing about South Africa is that you also don't have energy. So we are in a unique position because we don't have water and we don't have energy. In most countries, you find that it's either or. If you go to the Middle East, for example, they have a lot of energy, and they use that energy to extract water from the sea, so it works very well. I mean, Denmark has also a lot of, uh, uh, you've got water, you're surrounded by water around you, and they're using a lot of wind energy. I've seen that you've got wind uh, mills all over. So you have enough energy to extract water, so you are not really in any way in that. Until recently, US also had a similar case. Until they discovered shale gas, they also had uh, a lot of water, but not energy. So, so, so in our case, it's really unique that we don't have water and energy. So our solutions really would have to be unique to come up with um, uh, working uh, solutions. All right, so, so, so here I'm just giving examples of, of why we say there is a nexus. For example, if you talk about a steam turbine, you need to generate steam, which comes from water to run a turbine. If you talk about distribution of water, you need pumps to do that, which use energy. Treatment of water uses a lot of energy. Production of energy, for example, I have a case study here from ESCOM which generates uh, power. The major, one of the major users of water in South Africa is actually power generation. And that's the thing that you tend not to uh, look into. So that's really where the nexus comes from. And then we, we use uh, process integration techniques to, uh, to, to solve this problem. So that is uh, what I'm talking about there. So I'm gonna delve into this a bit more, uh, but really just to motivate 
uh, or get a motivation of why this is important. Uh, if you look at a typical system here, I've got a typical system in a chemical plant, you would have a, a regeneration uh, network. They might not have a network sometimes, they would have to maybe just one regenerator. A regenerator in this context would be your membrane system, for example, either reverse osmosis, which is very common in South Africa, or electrodialysis, which you would find commonly in the Middle East. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a, a regenerator. Uh, on the other side, you've got the uh, process. This is a network of processes. So these processes use water for various reasons. Uh, in chemical plants, we use water mainly for three reasons. We use water as a reaction medium, for example. Sometimes we recover that or it goes with the product. We use water for cleaning. And we also use water to extract energy or remove energy from the, from the, from the plant. So these are the main uh, avenues for using water. But if we take this uh, network, we call this, by the way, a superstructure. What you see there is a universal set of all possible solutions. So it looks as if I've got two regeneration systems there. Uh, it's actually, you can have any number of regenerators there. Any number, it's not limited. I've just given two here to illustrate the point because I'm saying any stream that comes from that regenerator could be taken to another regenerator depending on its qualities. It could go to, into the process, it could be recycled back into the regenerator. So there are many combinations that you have there. It's not limited to two, it can be any number of these regenerators. Same thing with the process, you can have any number of processes there, it's not necessarily two. So this is really a, a superset of all possible solutions and within that lies an optimum. And that is what I'm going to talk about, the search for the optimum in that uh, space. And then they go down to put energy, that's where your energy goes. The energy goes into running your regenerators. You need a lot of power to run the regenerators. Uh, the reverse osmosis, you need the pressure, the pressure drop uh, over, uh, to, to overcome the pressure drop. You use a lot of energy. For electrodialysis, you need to develop the potential difference. So there's energy that goes into that. And the reason why you have that energy is to maximize your recycle reuse within the operation because you treat uh, your, 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 your water, which can then be partially reused within the plant. And by so doing, you might then reduce the amount of water that you use. That's basically the problem that one is looking at. And the trade-off really is here. If you increase the amount of energy, if you increase the amount of energy, it means that you really purify your water to an extent that you maximize your recyclability or reusability of that water. And by so doing, you reduce the amount of fresh water that goes in there. So that is really the problem. And the question then that arises is, can we find a way, perhaps a systematic way, of arriving at this point? This is the point that we are looking for. So if you think of this as the energy cost that would go into your treatment, if you think of the, uh, this as your water-related cost, of course, the lesser the amount of water you use, the lesser the cost, then somewhere there lies an optimum. And basically, the methods that we are developing of the search of that optimum. So in simple terms, I think I've, I've defined now what the problem is, we all understand what the issue is. In simple terms, uh, this will be your problem statement uh, in words. It's really what I've just illustrated uh, in the pictures. This is now in words. So we've got the set of sources. We know the flow rates and the contaminant concentrations for the sources. We've got the sinks. Uh, a source, by the way, is any process that could generate water that could be used elsewhere. And then a sink is any process that could use water generated elsewhere. Very much along the lines of the symbiosis that was uh, uh, explained early on. So you've got the water regeneration units as well. You are given all the design parameters for that. The fresh water source is given, and we assume here that it would be unlimited, and then if you have your wastewater sink, which is also unlimited. And given all that information, then we are requested to determine the minimum flow rate of fresh water into the sinks, the minimum wastewater flow rate, as well as the optimum design variables for regenerators in order to minimize energy. That's, the, that's what you're trying to achieve here. You want to minimize the energy and water. And then with that, you must also come up with the new design. So it's not just setting the targets. You set the targets, you would say, for example, this is the minimum amount of water achievable in this operation, and then you go further and demonstrate how that is achieved. So you, there are two things here. It's the target as well as the design. So it's a complete framework in a way. Now, what you see there is just, a, again, an illustration of the point. I'm looking at a situation here where we are using two types of regenerators and electrodialysis as well as a reverse osmosis. Any plant, fortunately, in the world can be categorized in this fashion. You can split any plant into your sources and your sinks. Any plant would have a source of water somewhere, it would have a sink of water somewhere. So we can split this into two. So this is basically what we've done here. I've got the sinks on one end, I've got the sources on one end. And by the way, 
a source can also be the sink. Here yeah, we're just illustrating the performance. If you think of a cooling tower, uh, when the cooling tower receives water during makeup, it is a sink. But when it generates blowdown during the cleanup, it is a source because the blowdown could be used. As well. So the same operation could both be a source and the sink. But still, you would discretize it as shown over there. So this is the basis of the framework. And then this is a simple mass balance. Uh, because of the of time, I've only just selected a few equations that I think are key in achieving this. It's a really simple mass balance. This is basically that variable that you see there is that variable that goes into the electrolysis. That is the same as that. It's made up of all those streams. For example, these are the streams that come from all the sources. Uh, these are the recycled streams coming from either regenerator, uh, either regenerator, which would be, which would be electrolysis and reverse osmosis. And that stream over there is the stream that goes into the uh, reverse osmosis. It's also made up of all those possible streams. This particular constraint is simply saying that for every regenerator, there is a maximum load that is allowed, which is basically a design constraint because there's no regenerator that can take any amount or degree of contamination. So we have to set the bound for that. And these equations here are really saying that. So what you see there is the load. On top, the numerator is the load, the contaminant load. That is the maximum concentration. If you multiply that by that, you get the load that is taken by that regenerator. So this applies to the electrodialysis unit. This applies to the reverse osmosis unit. This is, by the way, in simple terms, your electrodialysis. For those who might not have come across this technology, this is electrodialysis. It is basically made up of alternating membranes. You've got the anodic exchange membranes. These are the anodic exchange membranes, which only allow the negative ions to pass. We've got the cathodic exchange membranes, which would reject the negative ions and allow the positive ions to pass. They alternate throughout, and then in between there, you have the concentrated the region with highly concentrated ions and the region with the less number of ions. So this would be a dilute stream, which you want to reuse, and this would be a concentrated stream, which ideally you would uh, dispense with as waste. So that's basically your membrane network. And then the question that arises, could you determine the optimum current that you need? The I there is the current, uh, the F there is the uh, Faraday constant. You can remember this when we did electricity at school. Uh, the N there is the number of cell pairs that you require. And the Z there is the balance of the ions that we use in the system. And then the L that you see there is the path length. This is the area that you want to determine. This is the width, and then the end there is the still, still the same as the end there, which is the number of cell pairs. The other equations that we use, of course, because it's modeling, in mathematical modeling, we have to make some assumptions. And there are assumptions that we make here, all of them very practical assumptions. For example, uh, the fluid that we are looking at is Newtonian. Like all very important fluids, it's Newtonian. You know, blood is Newtonian, water is Newtonian. I'm not sure about alcohol. Is alcohol Newtonian? But, but all good, uh, all important uh, fluids tend to be Newtonian. What that means is that the viscosity doesn't change with your rate of shear strain. It stays constant. And then we assume that the flow is steady, the flow is laminar, which is really fair. It's fully developed, fully developed meaning that the velocity profile stays the same throughout. If I measure velocity at one point here, and I measure it there, and I measure it there, equidistant from the wall, I'll get exactly the same value. This is the meaning of fully developed. And then the flow is incompressible, meaning that the density is constant. That's basically what you're saying there. And this is a very famous equation adapted in this case, of course. Uh, we use this equation a uh, lot in fluid flow. It's called the Hagen-Posé equation. Uh, if you took a shower this morning, that water that came to you, the, the, the piping system, that led that water to you was designed using that equation, the Hagen Posé. It affects all of us. But we've just adapted it there for a membrane system. You would have a 3-2 there for the Hagen Posé because it's designed for circular conduits. In this case, it's a rectangular cross, uh, cross section. Right, and this is your objective function, really. I'll now move with utmost speed in the interest of time. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. Oh, I have a bit of time. Okay. Right, so, so then that was the electrolysis unit. Then you've got the um, reverse osmosis. Again, with the reverse osmosis, the power really goes into uh, the, the pressure drop. So that, that's where the power goes. You must overcome it until the pressure drop. You must drive the fluid through this. Uh, that's where the power goes. So what you see there is the pressure drop, the delta P. This is the pressure drop on the shell side. Uh, this is the flux, the water flux. Uh, this is the solute permeability. 
this is the serine permeability to the AP, this is the osmotic pressure, and this is the, the, uh, the proportionality constant between the osmotic pressure and concentration. Uh, the end that you see there is no longer now the that end there is no longer your flux. I think I see that I used end. It can be confusing. The, the end that you saw earlier was the flux. The end that you see there is the number of modules that will ultimately contribute to your area. This is the surface area per module ultimately. So that's the objective function. You'll see in the objective function for the reverse osmosis, we've got the pumping, uh, the pumping, uh, the, the pressure. This is the, the, the pressure for, for the pump. That's where the energy goes. And then we've taken the efficiencies for the pumps uh, into account. This is the efficiency for uh, the pump that generates pressure, and this is the efficiency for the pump that removes uh, pressure. Uh, let me just say this, sorry, it's important that I mention this. Also in the electrolysis framework, we've got the energy there. This is the pumping energy, and this is the energy, the specific energy to, to generate your potential difference. So we take energy into account during this uh, water normalization. The first set of constraints, we're looking at water recycling and reuse. So we're looking at water specifically. The, the latter set of constraints is really taking care of energy. And that's where the energy water nexus comes in. Because you are designing a system that is going to be uh, efficient in terms of energy, but also efficient in terms of water. The rest is just straightforward. This is the removal ratio, and the others are liquid recovery. So that is really straightforward. Maybe this one's our most important. The, objective function here. the overall model for us, this is important. It might not be that important in this audience, but where I come from, it is very important to, de to declare the structure of your model. Uh, it is a mixed integer, non-linear program in the sense that you've got a number of continuous variables and integer variables. You also have a set of non-linear constraints. This is very important for us because it determines the quality of the solution that you are going to get. MI and NLP are arguably among the most difficult set of problems to solve. And then we use what is called the general algebraic modeling system uh, to solve this. And then this is the solver that we use there on. It's a very nice name. It sounds like a, a human being's name, but it stands for Branch and Reduce Optimization Navigator. If I happen to have a child later on, I might say Baron. <laughs> but let me give you a nice uh, uh, a case study, a very simple case study. Uh, again, it will be very, this is a pulp and paper case study. It's a real life case study. In fact, I might declare it's from Sabi, okay? So it's the way that we did for SAPI, and I've just given you just part of the plan here. But what you would go out, what you would do going about doing this uh, kind of work, you'd identify all the sources and all the things, as I said. For example, a washer. That washer over there is taking water in, so it's a sink. The screening operation takes water in and out, so it's both the sink and the source. Uh, those two strippers there are both sources, because the, the, we, only, we only use the water that goes out of that. And then we've got a bleaching section there also, which is both a source and the sink. And then with that, we now have all the information. When you get to this point, by the way, in doing this kind of work, you are almost there. Just to, just to do this, just to do this, to determine all your sources and your sink, this is about 75% of the project time. Because you must fully understand what the plant is all about. So that takes a long time. But once you've done it, once you get to this point, really, it's mathematics. You can press the button and get uh, all the results quickly. But we tend not to rush to this. It's very tempting to rush. But you tend to take it easy. But when you get to this point, we now have your sources, we now have your sinks. We also have all your information in terms of your flow rates, the concentrations. And we also have all the uh, details in terms of our membrane systems. And then ultimately, these are the results that we've got. In simple terms, what I want to draw attention to is the savings in terms of water. You can see the base plant was using that amount of water. And ultimately, that could be reduced to that amount of water. And this is now the specification of the removal ratios for the electrodialysis unit as well as the reverse osmosis unit. So this is the performance. And this is very important, by the way, because in most instances, when they specify a, a membrane system to the suppliers now, they'll give you a membrane with about, say, 99 or 98% uh, removal ratio. Sometimes you don't need that. But that comes with a lot of energy. So with this system here, you can determine the actual amount of your, or the actual values of your removal ratios, the ratios. And then this is the amount of, in percentage terms, this is the amount of fresh water that you save and this is the amount of waste water that you see. The only uh, downside here is this one. I must say that it takes a very long time to solve uh, these models. But in most instances, you solve them once. Uh, you might not understand that because it comes directly from that earlier diagram that I showed you, but this you will understand. So from here, if you interpret this carefully, it yields exactly this. So now this is the plan, the flow sheet that is completed. You can see now some recycling and reuse opportunities. 
the water from uh, the regenerator is reused in other operations. You can see now it's a complete plant. You no longer have any separation of your recycling and reuse opportunities. And then these are the specifications also of all the variables that you have in your system. That those are energy related variables. Uh, there's area there as well. There's the area, this is the area that you have for the ED. And then in terms of energy, in this case, in other words, if we had disregarded this kind of technique and just, you know, used our brute force analysis as we normally do, we would have used 12% more energy in this situation. And lastly, just in closing, I just want to share with you some of the work that is still very close to my heart. We did this literally now two years ago uh, at Creel. Uh, 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 you know this Creel uh, power station. It's in Pumalanga. It's a 3.6 gigawatt facility. South Africa as a whole is about a 43 gigawatt country. So you can see that is quite a, a substantial uh, power facility, uh, just less than 10% of the national uh, uh, grid requirement. So we did some work there. The remit was very simple. What options do we have to reduce water in this facility? Just to give you some illustration, the intention is not for you to read and understand that. I'm just trying to show you how the flow sheet looks like. I don't think you'll be able to follow what's happening. But overall, the major users of, of water are those cooling towers. You put a north cooling tower and a south cooling tower, and they receive water from two rivers, Usutu River and Val River. But, okay, I'll get to that point. I wanted to show you the values now of the water that we are using in these operations. So we, we have to separate into sources in the sinks, just like we did with the other operation. And then ultimately, we have all the concentrations for all these streams. We have the flow rate, and all the information that we need really to do modeling. And again, this takes a very long time to get to, we have to work with the engineers, people who understand the plan so that you can, don't come up with results that don't make sense. But look at these values. I'm just giving you now the values. At the moment, that facility is sitting at 119 uh, megaliters of water per day. Cape Town, as a city, uses about 400 megaliters a day. I'm, I'm illustrating the point. It's one plant. Multiply this by about 20, CSCOM is about 20, somewhere there about in South Africa. Multiply that figure, and then that tells you how much water goes into making our power. So when you say you want more electricity, actually we are saying you want to get water from somewhere. But this is a kind of that also doesn't have water. So it tells you that there is a, there's some communication that, <coughs> breakdown that there is. Because if you hear what people in water say, and what people in energy say, I don't think they understand that link. So ultimately what we wanted to achieve, uh, right now that plant is sitting at 3.1 liters of water per you This is what the technology used in, in, in the utilities industry. USO is unit sent out, which is your gigawatt sent out. Uh, they are sitting at 3.1 at the moment. They wanted to take that down to 1.8 because they believe that the plant would be at 1.8 liters of water per unit sent out. What we demonstrated to them was that if they don't use any regenerator, they would never go below 2.1 liters of water per unit sent out. They won't. So the 1.8 was just the pipe dream, it wouldn't be achieved. However, if they use regeneration, they could take it down to 1.9. And they applied the solution. And by the way, you can go, this is now documented, they saved about 5 million rand within six months of applying this kind of work. So that's why I like this case study. It's a really applicable. And this is the final plant, actually. But this one is the one that uses the reverse osmosis. They did not apply this. In fact, they forgo, they, they forwent this option. They did not take this. Uh, into account, they removed all the uh, membrane systems and took the first solution. This solution here does not involve the membrane system. That's the solution. Okay. So these are the energy savings, about 43% savings in terms of energy and huge amounts in terms of uh, water. Uh, here you might not be too interested in this again. This, I'm just illustrating the point in terms of how long it, it takes to solve these models. What is the structure of the model? The discrete variables. The discrete variables are really your number of uh, cell pairs in the case of uh, uh, number of cell pairs in the case of uh, um, electrolysis, and uh, that will be the binary variables also that tells you whether you need that unit or you don't because you've got a uh, superstructure. So those are discrete variables which take uh, uh, integer values. Right. So we still have to deal with this. In fact, the work that we are doing now is to solve this. We want to bring down this value uh, to seconds and not hours. So in conclusion, uh, I think I won't read through that because I've said all that, uh, that to you now. But I think we've been very successful in demonstrating that there is a need to develop these systematic techniques. 
and we've also been able to apply this in real life. Uh, and maybe what I can do is to, these are the publications. We also do a lot of publications. This is the thing now with where I am. It's not just the practical element, but you also have to publish general publications so that you are recognized. Otherwise, they don't take you seriously. <laughs> so these are the, these are the uh, general publications. And you have to be very careful what type of journals you choose. All the, yeah, so these are the In our space, these are very good journals. This is my team. A lot of those people have left, by the way. Uh, but but uh, this is basically, the team it evolves, of course. It changes over time. And these are my funders. You can see I've scratched myself. <laughs> because I don't want to you know we are in South Africa. So it can be very dangerous. If I left the thing out, I'm sure there was going to be a lot of talk when I leave. No, I'm not funded by the CSR. But I do work with the CSR. And I said so. My position as the chairperson must never stifle science. So we do our science. We do it for no monetary gain. I love doing it. And I will do it beyond this temporary arrangement called chairperson. So, so, so the funders are uh, the NRF. I'm funded heavily by the NRF. I hold the chair for the NRF, the Water Research Commission, and so, so there are other funders next up. But these are the major funders. Thank you.